Thank you, Stavros. So it's my pleasure to thank the organizers for this uh, wonderful conference. And I'm very grateful to be invited to participate. Um, I want to report on a joint work with uh, Frédéric Fauvet and Ricardo Schiappa. This is work in progress uh, on exact WKB method and parametric resurgence, a subject which was initiated by uh, André Voros and Jean Ical in the late 70s. And so here I mentioned just uh, 1983, a famous paper by André. And uh, um, in 84, there was this paper, Cinq applications des fonctions résurgentes, and with one of the applications was dedicated to the WKB problem. And in 94, there was also a very interesting preprint on weighted convolutions weighted products. So then there was work by the Nice school, de la barre, Dillinger, Femme, and there is a famous DDP paper in 93, often quoted. There was also the Kyoto school, with Kawai and Takei, and uh, I mentioned here 2005, uh, a monography by them, but they, were, they had many collaborators among whom, and there were among them um, Koike, that's Yakoike who uh, passed away sadly last year. More recently, there was a lot of activity, a renewal of interest. Here is a, a selection. This is a very partial bibliography. Uh, the article by Gayoto Moore, Nightskin, 2000, 2008, was certainly very interesting about WKB and um, the wall crossing formula and the BPS spectrum and uh, Konsevich Oldman about the um, wall crossing formula. Uh, I quote here Pasquetti Schiappa because of topological string theory and uh, um, Garofalidis, it's Kapayev Marino uh, because of the connection with pain levé instantons. Um, I like particularly Iwaki Nakanishi, 2014, nice survey about WKB analysis and the connection with cluster algebras. And very recently, uh, this year, uh, Ito Marinyushu about TPA equations and Riemann Hilbert problems. Just to say that there is a lot of activity, uh, renewal of interest about this subject. So our aim is to explain, if possible, where resurgence comes from using a tool invented by uh, Jean Ecal, uh, an inductive construction of elementary non-trivial resurgent functions for which mold formalism is particularly efficient. So I'll try to explain that at the end of the talk. So the message is that these molds help elucidate the resurgent structure. They help establish the so-called bridge equations which are behind the Stokes automorphisms or the DDP formula. And they also induce recursive constructions of, let's say, endpoint correlation functions in the spirit of other recursions we heard about. So that would be the very end of the talk. So let's start with uh, the one-dimensional stationary Schrodinger equation written in that form. So psi is the wave function, x is the variable, eta is one of the h bar, so it's a large parameter. And um, q, here we take for q uh, a polynomial, or it could be a polynomial plus a polynomial in one over eta, it could be more general. Um, so we are given in slightly more geometric terms, um, meromorphic quadratic differential q dx square on a compact Riemann surface, namely the Riemann sphere, which is regular outside a finite set. So of course there is the pole at infinity, uh, but the, the zeros of the, of the function q count as singularities for the quadratic differential, so they are called the turning points. Um, so we have a complex curve, which we denote by c dot 2. So c dot is just um, the regular um, set. And c dot square is the double cover of c dot, on which 
we have a, a square root of our quadratic differential, namely p dx, because um, um, because um, so let me write this, like this: lambda zero can be written q to the one half dx, and q to the one half is holomorphic on c dot two. Now, um, WKB method will produce, let's say, an h-bar extension of this uh, classical one form, a formal one form on the complex curve. Lambda is p dx, where p starts with q to the one half, and you have a formal series in one over uh, eta, an h-bar series. And I call it a one form because it will be invariant by coordinate changes and the coefficients will be uniquely determined and they will be holomorphic on the complex curve. So the definition will be recalled in a moment. We want to study this formal series in eta with coefficients holomorphic functions in the x. Uh, and we want to study the Borel transform with respect to the parameter eta. This is parametric resurgence. So here is the definition. Uh, the Borel transform replace eta by xi, so we get hopefully a germ, hopefully a function of x and xi holomorphic for um, xi of modulus small enough. So the rule being that we divide by the factorials like this and this should be endlessly continuable with respect to xi in the sense that the analytic continuation exists in the large with only isolated singularities. Uh, we repeat the Schrodinger equation. So not only will we produce this, um, this uh, lambda, so I don't tell you yet what is this lambda, but we will also produce solutions to the formal solutions to the Schrodinger equation in the form of the WKB ansatz. So there is this exponential i eta a, where a is the classical action function, the integral of q to the one half, which is well defined on our um, complex uh, curve. But of course, the, the primitive is multi-valued on the complex curve. <coughs> we have this q to the minus one fourth, and then we have phi plus, or phi minus if we take the opposite branch of q to the one half. And phi plus and phi minus will be series in 1 over eta normalized by starting with the constant 1. So these coefficients um, phi 0, phi 1, like A, will be multivalued. And the series phi plus and phi minus are determined only up to a multiplicative x independent factor, of course, because it's a linear equation will be interested in the Borel transform with respect to the parameter eta, at least for certain choices of normalization, since there is this question of determining one uh, solution that we will Borel transform. Maybe certain choices are better than others. So I repeat, resurgence consists in being endlessly continuable in the variable xi, depending on x. Maybe this property will hold for generic x, but not all x. For instance, x should not uh, touch the turning points. Um, simplest example. So let me repeat the formula for the WKB ansatz here. Uh, so we have plus or minus i eta a of x, q to the minus 1 4. This is very, very classical, of course. Phi plus or minus of x and eta, and of course you, you notice that this a of x is just the integral of lambda 0 from some reference point x0 that we fix once for all. Let us see the simplest possible example, only one turning point and nothing else. Turning point of multiplicity m, let's say, at the origin, so we call xj is the turning points and we call x infinity the pole at infinity. In that case, you compute uh, the action function a of x, you compute q to the minus one fourth, and 
it so happens that there is a closed form for the Borel transform of uh, these series, phi plus and phi minus. You notice that I have inserted this factor, this monomial, eta to the minus mu minus one, where mu is this number depending on the multiplicity m. So this is just convenient, just to so in this way we get an algebraic function of xi. So you see that the, if you replace phi plus by one, the Borel transform of that monomial is just xi to the mu divided by gamma of mu plus one. Here, um, when you take the Borel transform of the product, you have this very uh, elementary formula. And uh, so you observe that indeed, the thing is convergent in the xi plane. And indeed, it has a nice analytic continuation. It's algebraic, phi plus, the Borel transform phi plus has only one singularity at 2i a of x and uh, phi minus has only one singularity at minus 2i a of x. Now, what is the singularity of Borel of phi plus? Um, let me write this. It should be clear that it will be proportional to the Borel of phi minus. Indeed, uh, let's have a look. Uh, Borel of uh, eta minus mu minus one phi plus. You can write, you can factor out this two i a of x. Uh, let's put it in front, two i a of x power minus mu divided by gamma of mu plus one. And we have this uh, xi of mu, xi to the mu and two i a of x minus xi power mu. Now, what does it mean to consider the singularity at that point? It means that we, we replace xi by 2ia plus zeta, and we want that xi approach 2ia, approach, uh, we want zeta to approach zero. So you see that this will become exponential i pi mu zeta to the mu, and this will become 2ia plus zeta power mu. So in fact, you exactly, you find the same formula as here. So in fact, if you, it's an exercise in alien calculus, if you manipulate this alien operator in def defined by ECAL, which is that just the, um, the smart way of measuring singularities in the Borel plane, you find this formula, so it, well, it's an exercise, you have this exponential i pi mu, but then you have to, to study the dictionary between the singularity and the function in the xi. I mean, you have the notion of major, the singularity of a ma is, a, is defined by a major, and then you take the minor. So when you compute, you find this sine function. Incidentally, that formula was written by Jean Ricard in, in 81, in the second book of the series of on the resurgent function in quite a dif slightly different context. It was in the context of equational resurgence dealing with Riccati equation and in fact we'll see the Riccati equation in a moment. Um, so particular case m is one this is the um, quantum airy equation parametric airy equation you find the, the Stokes constant this number here this proportionality factor will be minus i in that case, because uh, mu is uh, minus one over six. And for the quantum harmonic oscillator, you find different number. Okay, that is really the simplest example you can dream of. So now to the associated Riccati equation. Um, we consider the logarithmic derivative of the wave function psi, and it's an exercise, it's very clear that uh, you agree that um, if i eta p is exactly the logarithmic derivative, then its derivative is written like this, and so the Schrodinger equation is equivalent to that Riccati equation, p square equal to q plus i eta inverse derivative of p. And now there are only two formal solutions to that equation. Indeed, it's clear that you can choose to start with plus or minus q to the one half. And then, once you have chosen that, the branch, the, the rest of the series is determined. 
Uh, here is the next term. It so happens that it is a logarithmic derivative. And then plus or minus this, etc. So you find two well-defined uh, formal series. Uh, by the way, they are related because uh, it's uh, Galoisian. I mean, um, if you go, you can go from one branch to the other by the covering involution. And so you exchange the two solutions by the covering involution, which defines a complex curve uh, C dot 2. And from those two uh, formal series, you can recover all WKB solutions to the Schrodinger equation. Indeed, since we are speaking of a logarithmic derivative, it's just a matter of choosing a primitive of P plus or P minus, and then exponentiating it, and then you are free to multiply by any X independent factor. So we will recover it this way when you apply this recipe, though the first term here is responsible for exponential plus or minus i eta a. Indeed, remember, a is just the primitive of q to the one half that we have chosen. The logarithmic derivative of q is easy to integrate, and you get to this q to the minus one fourth. And then this, the remainder here, will give rise to a series phi plus or phi minus, as we had said previously. So what is this lambda that we had promised at the beginning, there would be um, a one form, formal in eta, in this problem. Uh, what is p? It's just the age bar extended momentum. It's the half of the difference. You have two solutions, you take half difference, and you can check that indeed it's, it gives rise to a one form. Uh, now, each series, p plus or p minus, is the plus or minus the half difference, plus the half sum. And it so happens that the half sum is the logarithmic derivative of the half difference. This will help us to handle this question of normalization choices. Um, the coefficients of p plus and p minus are uniquely determined, holomorphic on our complex curve. They have piezo expansions at the turning points and at infinity, and you check that there is no term in the form 1 over x minus xj, as a consequence to, ch to choose a normalization for psi plus or psi minus, to choose the, the factor here, is equivalent to select uh, a primitive of p plus or p minus, or equivalently a primitive of p, uh, curly p. Uh, so here is what we do. So we must integrate this. So let's split p curly p, there is the, the first term, q to the one-half, and then there is the remainder, curly y, with this factor q to the one-half. And then correspondingly, uh, p plus or p minus is plus or minus the first term, then this, we repeat, and then we have plus or minus 1 over i eta q to the one-half curly y. And so we can define what we will call the xj normalized solution, xj being one of the turning points or the pole at infinity, like this. We, we don't touch the prefactor, the exponential prefactor. We, here we have p, curly p to the minus one half, because we are starting with this, we are using this, uh, the, this natural primitive of the, der the logarithmic derivative. And here we must choose a primitive of q to the one half curly y. So we choose the primitive whose piezo expansion on xj does not contain any constant term. That's a reasonable choice. Uh, equivalently, this is the average of the primitives corresponding to um, the base point A varying along a cycle on the complex curve. Um, so something more about these um, normalization. Uh, because they play a role in the theory. So psi j plus or psi j minus, you can write it this way using this slightly different notation for the selection of primitive. And so q to the one half curly y, this is just lambda minus lambda zero. And a, of course, we know what it is. Um, so here appear the so-called Voros coefficients. They allow to connect one uh, normalization to the other. How do you go from j to k? You multiply by uh, a certain integral and, and the integral of uh, q to the one-half curly y. 
Uh, now, there is a remark, uh, let me do a picture, that mm, y is invariant by the covering involution. So when you multiply by q to the one half, you can use this formula. Uh, you have uh, xj here, and you have uh, x somewhere. And uh, so instead of doing this business of um, choosing the, um, the primitive by looking at the Puiseux expansion, you can do that. You can say, uh, let's do this. So there is a cut here. So you start from x star, the, the other point for the other branch, and you turn around. So this is the path gamma j x, which is here. So it starts from x star, it encircles positively x j, and then it goes back to x. And you compute that the integral on that path is exactly what you want. So this means that our coefficient pi j, our integral is just, let's say, a quantum period. It's i eta over 2, the one half comes from here, of lambda minus lambda 0. Uh, so what you can do in that problem is to, oh yeah, maybe I should explain what is gamma jk. Um, I mean, here we have another uh, turning point, x j, x k, and we are supposed to compute the difference between these two primitives. So the difference can be computed by saying that uh, we, do, we do this. Oh, well, let's say there is no. So we, we find a cycle appearing in the. So this is the gamma j, j k. It's the cycle around j and k. Um, and then we can then next we can choose, let's say we have our reference point somewhere here, x0, so we can choose a basis for the homology and, and so this would be gamma j, gamma k. So we can compute, compute once for all these um, pi j of eta. So integral from x0 to xj with the rule that we have set for the uh, turning point. Uh, following the path gamma j that we have selected in advance. Okay. Um, so this is a definition of a normalization for each uh, singularity. At infinity, the situation is simpler because the coefficients um, decay at infinity and you get integrable functions. So you can replace this uh, funny uh, selection of primitive by the usual integration from infinity. Uh, so here is what you can do. Uh, let us split p plus and p minus like before. We have the first term plus or minus q to the one half. We have the second term and then we call y plus or minus the rest with this prefactor. So we define this way y plus y minus. And so you see that curly y is just half the difference. And now uh, the point is that the normalization at infinity is just defined like this. Uh, using the integral of, of q to the one half, this y plus or y minus integrated from infinity to x. So the, no the solution normalized at infinity are characterized by the vanishing of at infinity of all the coefficients except the, the very first one. We said that this phi plus should always start with one. And so what is y plus? It's just a logarithmic derivative essentially of phi plus, of uh, phi plus or minus infinity. So why are they resurgent? Where does resurgence come from for these, all these objects, the, the, the y plus, the y minus, the phi j plus or minus? We will deal with phi infinity plus or minus, which is easier to define. So why is it resurgent? Let us define a vector field on our complex curve, d. d is q to the one half d over dx, so it's dual to the square root of the quadratic differential. It's dual to this uh, lambda zero. And this way, using you can, we can rephrase the Schrodinger equation using uh, the unknown phi plus or minus instead of psi and using d instead of d over dx. 
And here is what we get. So we have this function k, which is very important. k is uh, given by that formula. So it comes from the initial q, which we, are start we have started with. <laughs> and correspondingly, we can change a known in the Riccati equation. And again, we can use this uh, vector field d, this derivative, uh, and we get this equation for y plus and y minus. OK. So y plus or minus, in this sense, is the, the d logarithmic derivative of phi plus or mi of minus. And uh, here it's not the xj normalized solution, it's the x infinity normalized solution. So here we, we are supposed to invert d. So to invert d, we multiply by q to the one half, and we choose the primitive which vanish at infinity. So it's the x infinity based right inverse to d. So why will it be resurgent? We can compute, in a sense, phi plus and chi plus. So these are the notation, the, the, log the d derivative of phi plus. So remember that y plus will just be the ratio of these two. <laughs> we can compute as well phi minus and um, d minus 2 i eta phi minus using the Neumann series because it's a linear problem. So it's a very particular case of parametric resurgence. So this, you recognize here the Riccati equation for the phi series using d. So we insert this chi plus, it's d phi plus, and so the second equation is this. And now we say we, ha we have specified the way we solve the, solu the, the equation. We have specified that phi plus should start with a 1, and then the, the other coefficients vanish, and chi plus will uh, vanish. In fact, we know how to invert this because here we are dealing with operators in um, formal series in eta with coefficients holomorphic on the complex curve C dot 2. So k, curly k is just the multiplication operator by k. And what is the inverse of d plus 2 i eta? It's given by the geometric series. This is a perfectly well-defined operator. Uh, with, we have eta to the power minus k minus 1. So you differentiate all the coefficients. And you see that you differentiate the, the coefficients of holomorphic functions. And you do not compensate by any factorial. So you expect Gevray growth and you expect divergence. Yes. Series in inverse eta. Yes. Series in inverse eta, always. always. Oh, yes, you're right. Here, it should, uh, minus 1 is lacking. Thank you. So the Neumann series for this linear problem gives you this. So phi plus. You see, you start with 1 and you repeatedly you multiply by k, in, apply this inverse operator, and then you integrate from infinity. And chi plus, there is uh, this difference, you have one more factor. Uh, similarly, for phi minus, when you do the computation, you find this, <coughs> minus 2i eta times something, which starts with 1 over minus 2i eta and uh, chi minus is this. So you have four series of formal series in 1 over eta. So we are, we are dealing with series of formal series, but each of these terms, each one individually, is a non-trivial resurgent function. So why is that so? It's because the counterpart of the operator that we use d plus e 2i epsilon eta. So epsilon here is obviously it's uh, either plus 1 or minus 1. Uh, here it's a typo, it's minus 1 to here. So we are using plus or minus 1. So in the Borel plane what happens? In the Borel plane we divide by the factorials. So we get an exponential series, an exponential of d. So d is a derivation, it's a vector field. Exponential of a vector field gives you the flow. So you see here the flow, the time t flow map of our d. So remember d is just q to the one half, minus one half of x d over dx. So we should inquire about the flow of that vector field. And when we, you know the flow, you take it at time minus xi over 2i epsilon, you substitute in 
in, in G. So if you start with G, not depending on eta. If you start with capital G, D, which is a series in eta, then the computation is uh, like this. Uh, multiplication by eta to minus k minus 1 gives rise to convolution by this monomial. And then you write the, the convolution as an integral. And again, you see the flow of um, our vector field at minus psi prime over 2i epsilon. So we get an integral operator and we see very concrete formulas that we can manipulate uh, and that we should apply to, to this. So we are taking now the Borel, we, we know how to handle the Borel transform of all these series. So the claim is that the Borel transform phi hat plus or minus, chi hat plus or minus are endlessly continuable. And where are the possible singularities? Where are they located? So the recipe is that uh, there cannot be a singularity at omega unless when you flow along this vector field starting from x until minus or plus omega divided by 2i, two, two you hit a turning point. So this is the recipe to determine the singularities of the Borel transform. So you see that the singularities in the xi plane depend, of, of course, on x. So the idea is that the vector field that we are considering is straightened by the so-called Uville transformation, which is just the action in function viewed as a change of coordinate. And in that coordinate z, the vector field is strengthened. Uh, so you can compute the flow, and, and in fact the, the quadratic differential is strengthened too, so you can use the local geometry of the quadratic differential if you want to analyze the behavior near xj, for instance. Um, so in that coordinate z, everything becomes uh, simple, but be careful that the coordinate z is defined locally, uh, and then you follow its analytic continuation. So there is a kind of periodicity in the problem, but it's tricky because everything is multi-valued on the complex curve C.2. So... Um, Excuse me, can you remind me what is omega x? So it's omega of x is defined in this claim. So what are the potential singular points? They are the points such that when you flow until that time, you hit a turning point. And in a moment, you will see that in fact, we are determining them, uh, we are here reaching an alternative definition because the, um, the flow, uh, here I'm using this gamma j, so from x0 to xj. If I start from x0, alpha j is the value of the action, one of the possible value, gamma j. But of course, if you follow different path, you get different values, you get replicas of this uh, singular point alpha j. So alpha j is a singular point for the flow map because uh, we are saying that uh, uh, the vector field vanishes here and so in finite time we hit a singular point of the vector field. Um, on the other hand, the function k that we are using in, in our Neumann series is meromorphic on C, but it has poles at the turning points. Hence, in coordinate z, k has endless analytic continuation, and where are the singularities in the z variable? They are located at the, all the possible values of the action function, action function a. So alpha j plus uh, um, multiples of the classical periods. So this is the description in variable uh, z starting from x0, but now we are starting from x, so we must shift everything by z. So the recipe which is here gives us z minus or plus omega over 2i is alpha till, one of these values. So omega of x, this is the answer to your question, is plus or minus 2i action of x minus alpha tilde. Uh, and so why... Yeah. In these integers? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's just the action, it's just a representation of the homology group. Excuse okay. me, um, also, among these x1 to xm, you count x infinity also, mm -hmm. or not? No, no not, here. not here. 
Not here because you cannot go to infinity in finite time. Yes, of course you can in uh, for cube 4, for x4 you can. Oh, maybe I'm mistaken then. Uh, let me think. No, no, no. Uh, look, uh, z is primitive of q to the one half. So we, we, are integrating, uh, we are integrating the square root of the polynomial. So the, it's integrable at the turning point, but it's not integrable at infinity. This is the non-integrable part that we are always skipping. Uh, when, we comp when we go to infinity, we must almost always remove that part. I, 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 may I courteously disagree? I mean, I, 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 I discovered that, in fact, you should not remove it. It's nicer. You can get cleaner things if you don't remove it. But I can believe it. I can believe it. I mean, I, this is probably not the definitive version of... Uh, I would be happy to see your comment in detail on that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so where does this condition come from? So I claim that this is the condition to have possibly a singular point. Where does it come from? So remember, we were dealing with these Neumann series so, uh, of that form. So in the case of phi plus, we have to invert d plus 2i eta. So the Borel transform involves the flow at times minus xi over 2i. And so this is why we get uh, the condition uh, like it was written. Uh, flow at minus omega over 2i should be uh, on the singular locus. Similarly for phi minus, so the next question, in, if we are dealing with the resurgent structure of phi plus and phi minus, is what are the alien derivatives? Uh, so I'll be a bit sketchy, but because, um, in fact, it's work in progress. So these formulas are written in the literature, but our understanding is still in progress. <laughs> so, uh, but um, the idea would be the following. If you are dealing not with the solution normalized at infinity, but with the solution normalized at xj, the alien derivative will be governed by the sj that we have computed a moment ago. So all, everything here is like as if you are dealing only with a, a pole, and uh, with a, um, a monomial q of x. You can substitute q of x by this by the multiplicity, mj is the multiplicity at xj, and you get that result. But that is true only for phi j, when you are dealing with the alien derivative at a minus alpha j. Now, if we, go, if we want to deal with phi infinity, we must go from phi j to phi infinity, and for that purpose, we can use the Voros coefficients. And so now, now that's an easy computation. The alien derivative of that guy should be the exponential multiplied by the alien derivative of that guy. So we have the sj and we get twice pi because uh, one comes from here and the other comes when you uh, express phi j minus in terms of phi infinity minus. And similarly for the other, for the other one. So we can go on and get formulas for the um, alien derivative of the Riccati solution, because it's a general fact in, in resurgence, I mean, this part of the theory of Jean, that um, if you are dealing with resurgent functions, their ratio will, ratio will be resurgent, their exponential, their logarithm, is, logarithm will be resurgent. So, and moreover, there is an alien chain rule if you want to compute the alien derivatives of these. So once you have computed the alien derivatives of one set of uh, solutions, you can, in principle, you can deduce the rest of the structure. And then the next question is, uh, but what about the alien derivative of that coefficient? So, um, in fact, here I'm referring implicitly to the um, to second bridge equation and the third bridge equation. So here, this is here that DDP formula would appear. Uh, because the um, location of singular points for that factor, that factor does not depend on x. It's a uh, Voros coefficient, it doesn't depend on x. We have integrated in x. So you can guess that the singular points will be located at, that, at those points, the classical periods. So I stop here my comments on the resurgence because I want to move on to something different. Um, we have said that uh, we would 
reach the resurgent structure using these representations of the solutions normalized at infinity by means of these uh, Neumann series, series of elementary non-trivial resurgent series. A way of motivating what follows is to ask, can we do the same for y plus and y minus? So we have said, we are confident that it's a ratio of resurgent series, it will be resurgent. But can we uh, analyze y plus and y minus in the same manner that we analyzed phi, plus, phi infinity plus and phi infinity minus? So here is what happens. We have our four uh, series of series. Here is a compact way of rewriting them. I introduce those series M indexed by plus or minus, epsilon 1, epsilon 2, epsilon r. These are strings, these are words, the letters of which are plus or minus. So when the word is empty, you have 1. And then uh, how do you define M associated with a word of length r? So it's an inductive definition, so you invert this operator, d plus 2i eta, the sum of the letters, you invert it using uh, primitive at infinity, vanishing at infinity, if the sum happens to be zero, and then you apply that to b with the first letter. b with the first letter is either k or 1. <coughs> and then this is the... Uh, the the function, the series associated with the truncated word in which you have removed the first letter. So is that clear for you? For instance, start with phi plus. So you have, what is this nth term? So we have 1, so you multiply by k, you apply this operator, multiplication by k, and applying the operator, this is multiplying by b plus, and applying d plus 2i eta, when there is only one letter, which is epsilon 1 equal to plus. But then, Immediately after that, you apply the inverse of the infinity, which is that case when epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2 is 0. So this is why I, I wrote here m minus plus. I started with a plus, so that was the... and then I have a minus, etc. So these are um, elementary uh, series. This is a family of series indexed by words on the alphabet plus or minus one. This is the definition of a mold, a family of object indexed by words. But here we see only a slice of the mold. We are using only alternate words of length, of even length or odd length, but only alternate words. What about the other words? What about the rest of the mold? What will, we, what will it do for us? So I repeat here. Uh, the definition of the mold, the inductive definition. I repeat what we have obtained so far, and here is the claim. We can represent the solutions to the Riccati equation in the same way. So here we have series with coefficient 1 and only uh, peculiar words, but here we will use a different subset of words. Uh, and we have different coefficients. These coefficients beta plus and beta minus are integers. They are very often zero. To be non-zero, beta plus requires the sum of the letters to be one. And the value is computed by iterating these operators. So you have two elementary operators, d over dy minus y squared d over dy. You see that uh, there is homogeneity going ho on here. Um, because b plus is homogeneous of degree minus 1, b minus of degree plus 1, so when you do the composition, you see that um, um, the product applied to y will have degree 1 minus the sum, but if the sum is 1, it's a constant, and that constant is an integer number. <coughs> so this is the recipe to compute <coughs> beta plus, and the recipe for beta minus is here. So now we are interested in words whose sum is minus 1. And uh, so I claim this, and I also claim that uh, if you forget the factor minus 1 to the r plus 1, instead of finding y minus, you will find 1 over minus 2 i eta plus y minus. So why is that true? I would like to spend five minutes to explain that. Um, it's very uh, elementary part of mold calculus, 
as defined by Eccal. So let's rephrase it here in our context. The key point is a certain family of quadratic relations. So we are dealing with a, a mold on a certain alphabet, which was plus or minus one, with value in a ring R. It was in our case the ring of formal series in eta whose coefficients are holomorphic on the complex curve C.2. So we said uh, a mold is just a, a family of objects indexed by words. So we can say this is the collection of values of a sequence of functions. So giving a mold V is like giving a sequence of functions and the nth function depends on n arguments. These quadratic relations that we will write are called symmetrality relations. So here, here it goes, V0 should be a constant, it's a function on, of nothing, and that constant should be the unit of our ring, and then for all PQ, for all P tuple B, for all Q tuple C, the product should, be, should coincide with this sum. So it's a sum of values of Vn, n is p plus q. So you take the sum of all subset of the set of indices 1 to the n, to n, so i is the subset of cardinality p, j is the complement, cardinality q, and what is this? This is the entople a, the unique entople such that when you extract the i part you recover b, and when you extract the j part you recover c. So I wrote the formula in this way because it's reminiscent of something which is well known in topological... Previous example? Yes, here V is a um, general mold and we will apply this to M. So this is, this is just a more general definition. A1, yes. A1, AN was plus and minus? Exactly. Exactly. Here is a typical example of mold satisfying this uh, quadratic relation. And our M is very much of the same nature. So here is the standard way we rephrase this property in uh, mold calculus. Uh, this is absolutely equivalent to, to using the shuffling of the two words B and C. So our mold M satisfies this. So our mold M is defined on plus on, on the, the two, alphabet, two letter alphabet. It is symmetrical and you can check it by induction on the length of the, on the sum of the length on the sum p plus q and it's not difficult because you have an inductive definition and you have a characterization. It's, it's defined through um, a differential equation with a boundary condition at infinity, so it's not difficult to test this property. So our mold is symmetrical. What good does it do to us? So remember that the Schrodinger equation was written for phi plus in the form of a system so this is the system for phi plus chi plus. Um, equivalently, we can say this is a vector field in, uh, or this is a derivation acting on that algebra, the algebra of formal series in y1, y2, whose coefficients are in R, and again the same typo, this, is, this should be eta inverse. So R is the, our coefficients take value in R, and let's consider these um, derivations. So D acts on the coefficients. D is the differential D over Dx, essentially. And um, so we have D over Dy2, D over Dy1. You remember that B plus is K. So B plus Y1, D over Dy2, this is what comes from this K phi, because phi is Y1. And um, B minus is 1, so this chi here is responsible for this y2 d over dy1. Let us call L0 the first part of the operator. Let's call B plus bar this operator, B minus bar that operator. So we are dealing with this uh, derivation, and this derivation encodes the Schrodinger equation in, in a certain sense. So these are derivations. Now let's consider this operator. So this huge sum, sum over all possible words of m, epsilon, and this product of derivations. So this is a formal, formally it's convergent, so it's, it defines an operator. And 
the inductive definition of our mool precisely says that uh, it conjugates L and L0. So it's a, like a normal form problem. We are conjugating what is given to us to something simpler. We have, get, we have gotten rid of these two terms. But because the mold is symmetrical, theta is an automorphism. That's a very general principle. Um, why is that true? It's because you see how theta is constructed. We are using the mold as coefficient, and here we are using product of derivations. Each derivation satisfies Leibniz rule. A product of derivation satisfies um, a generalized gen Leibniz rule. And when you write the generalized write Leibniz rule, because they do not commute, you see the shuffling coefficients appearing. And by duality, if the mold is symmetrical, then this guy will satisfy the, that the, pro the product is sent to the product instead of Leibniz rule. Some of all possible words, including the empty word. But the length? All possible length. It's a huge sum. And you don't put a factorial? No. No, the, um, no, no factorial here. So it's an automorphism. What are the automorphisms of the space of formal series? They are all substitution automorphisms. So we know in advance that theta f will be f composed with something, and that something is obtained by evaluating theta on y1 or y2. In fact, in our problem, when you do this, you find that this little theta, this uh, change, this formal change of coordinates in the y1, y2 space, is this. So everything is very simple in that case because the problem is linear. But wait a minute. So we obtain, I don't do the computation, but it's not difficult, you obtain that. So you can believe it, I mean, after all, what will happen when we evaluate this product of operators on y1 with so elementary vector field, it will be very easy to compute. You will see only alternate word, it's clear. So you get that. Okay. But remember, that operator is an automorphism. So I repeat the formulas here. Definition of b plus bar, b minus bar, definition of theta. And this is what we have obtained so far. Now, what is the general solution to the Riccati equation written for the y function? It's the logarithmic derivative of the general solution to Schrodinger. So the logarithmic derivative of... Uh, so you see the general solution to Schrodinger is sigma plus and sigma minus are just parameters. So since I focus on the equation with a plus, I see the multiples of phi plus and the multiples of phi minus appear with this correction exponential minus 2i eta a. A is lacking here. Uh, this uh, exponential minus 2i eta a because I'm switching from phi minus to phi plus. Um, so we can introduce sigma which would be sigma minus over sigma plus. And you see that this takes the form of a linear fractional evaluated on this uh, monomial. Uh, so let's introduce theta for Riccati to be that. So this is a, a formal uh, diffeomorphism in the y space with coefficients depending on x and eta. So and morally this y is just y2 over y1. Because theta is an automorphism, because of the symmetrality, when you compute theta of y2 over theta over y1, it's the same as theta of y2 over y1. So you can compute that thing, theta Riccati of y, as the evaluation of that big operator capital theta on y2 over y1. So previously we were just evaluating on y1 or on y2, but now we are evaluating on y2 over y1. And what do we find? Well, the image of, uh, by, by, by just one operator b plus is 1, and the image by one operator b minus is minus the square. So maybe you remember the formulas for b plus and b minus. They were just as simple as this. Um, so this is how we prove the claim. So we have obtained that formula, that y plus, the solution to Riccati, uh, is given by this mold expansion 
with coefficients beta plus, which are produced by these um, operators, elementary operators acting on y. So this is a very, very elementary instance of mold calculus, but what does it get? Where does it, does it get us? Um, mm. We have obtained this. We have a recursive definition of this m, and we, when we solve the induction, this is what m epsilon is. So epsilon is an arbitrary word, and so we are inverting that operator, multiplying by b epsilon 1, inverting that one, multiplying, etc. And whenever a suffix of the word has zero sum, the prescription is that we should use the primitive vanishing at infinity. Okay, let us define the resonance level of the word as the number of zero-sum suffix suffixes. How many terms here do vanish? How many times do we need to use the integration from infinity? The rest of the times will we use only the geometric series with uh, d, you remember. But um, because of those zero-sum suffixes, our m epsilon will involve an n-fold integration from infinity. And this is slightly reminiscent of something we've seen in the talk about topological recursion. So we are tempted to, gr to group together all the words with the same resonance level n. So let us introduce wn plus or minus as the sum uh, of the beta. So in this big sum, we extract the words with resonance level n, and we can call that n point component, why not, or n point correlation function, and then our y plus is the sum of that. So what we obtain here is that we have a recursive definition which produce, produces automatically a sequence of objects whose sum is really the solution to the Riccati equation. So after what you are just you just need to integrate from infinity to exponentiate and you get a WKB solution. And you know that um, it was mentioned in the previous talk that in the airy case um, topological recursion does produce a WKB solution, but here we have a, a different angle, a different way of constructing recursions, and so let's say this is food for thought. We, we plan to uh, investigate that uh, further. Thank you for your attention. So, it, to prove the claim, you need to prove that the, that the sum of terms converges somehow or other. You are referring to the last well, yeah. claim or...? I mean, anywhere. The, the <laughs> claim and then the... Uh, well, th there are claims of different nature. <laughs> uh, for instance, that one... What, where is it? Uh, that one... The main, no, the main claim. Ah, okay. The main, you mean on resurgence? Yes. Yes, uh, yes I skipped that part, but indeed. To prove uh, resurgence of phi infinity plus or phi infinity minus, we should establish that this series of formal series gives rise in the Borel plane to a series of functions, and that's a fact, no problem. But so then we need uh, normal convergence on the compact subsets to, to on a certain Riemann surface. Yes, indeed, this is the strategy, the reasonable strategy which was indicated by uh, Jean Ecal in as early as 84. So, I mean, is the, the, my question is at the end, are you planning to say that basically the WNs have some kind of, uh, that there's like not too many WNs and each one sort of uh, gets smaller and smaller and that that's why it converges? I mean, the, the series for Y plus is, is uh, we can, apply the same strategy directly, instead of invoking a general theorem which says the ratio between two resurgent seri series must be resurgent, we, we have access directly to, the, to a decomposition of y plus in, in elementary pieces uh, in the Riemann surface. So that's the strategy, yes, it would be to... Uh, and then after regrouping, we would like to see what happens. But, well, it's work in progress, as I mentioned at the beginning. And May I ask another question? So, so you had WNs. Yeah. Uh, maybe in the next slide? On the very end. Near the topological recursion. Yes. Here they are. Right there, right there. 
So are these WNs supposed to be factorially divergent? Um, y plus is, but is are WNs themselves? Yes, everything here is resurgent. I mean, this is a, no. a decomposition. I mean, in n, you mean factorial? Yes, you're oh, with n. respect to n, it's convergent. <coughs> with respect to n, we have convergence here. The divergent takes place only with respect to <coughs> one over eta. So this is a series of resurgent series which is convergent for the topology of resurgent functions. Because in topological recursion, <coughs> those sums are factorially divergent. So in fact, it's a different angle. So we are doing something else. Uh, yes. I think the point is, in fact, that those should be factorially convergent because when you do an n-fold integration, you get a 1 over n factorial. And then maybe there's only an uh, exponential number of terms or something. That's that is indeed the case. Yeah, but in topological recursion doesn't, doesn't happen, apparently. So, <laughs> so here, the, the, things, the computations are organized in a different way. So this is what we wanted to propose to that audience, uh, to, to see a different way of organizing the computations, yes. André? Okay, uh, I, I would like to ask you, uh, I'm very excited by this normalization at infinity, because I, I asked. In my work, I, I was guilty, I think. I didn't realize that it could be done. So uh, later, I, I made one, a normalization. And the advantage of normalizing at infinity, including the divergent part, is that you get something which is translation covariant. Mm -hmm. Now, is, <coughs> is your uh, normalization at infinity explicitly also covariant in, by translation? It's not mine. I mean, it's in the literature. It's... Uh, I mean, in, in FAM, it's already in FAM. Yeah. yeah. I think and uh, in fact, in, in uh, Ekal's paper in 84 already. Okay. Uh, so is it covariant? I mean, the trick is that uh, lambda 0 is not integrable at infinity. So you have, so you have to, sh you to remove that you part. You can't define it. That's the point. You can't define the integral to infinity by a, a, way, a classical version of zeta regularization. So in a way, it. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I perhaps it's it, finally, it might be uh, amount to what you are doing. So I'm very excited. So I didn't think too much about it because for us the idea is that we fix once for all this x zero, okay. and it appears only in this prefactor. It's a totally different business when we are referring to to the integration of that guy because here we have a whole series. So in, in theoretically we might change the selection of primitive at each term of the series and then we would get crazy things but here it's just once at the beginning so we didn't pay much attention to that but i would be interested in your comment uh, about uh, zeta regularization yes yeah so i haven't quite understood to write a full solution you would have still to write some bridge equation for the voros coefficients right Mm -hmm. um, and the second part was not some method to get around that, like you would still have to... Yes, it's, it's uh, yes. <laughs> These are two avenues of uh, research, yeah. I mean, yeah. I switched at some point from one, subject, one direction to another. Yeah, yeah. If there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker again.